worship God with you on a Wednesday night, amen. Um, and so uh, thank you, uh, Steve, for this interesting book. Uh, this is a great book that we've all been got, uh, went after to read in December. And uh, we really want as a family to make sure that, that the great lessons in this don't, don't go untouched. Yeah. And that our hearts go just totally uh, head over heels for God in every single way. Amen. Amen. Um, and so I, I appreciate what, how, what Angie calls the book. She calls it the, the faith book. Amen. And I really do believe that that's what this book is about. It's yeah. all about faith. Amen. Yeah. Um, check out Ecclesiastes. Well, Chapter 10. On, There's going to be a, a lot of verses today, so I hope you brought a pen. Hope you brought, brought a notebook, and I hope you brought an open heart. Come on. In Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, it says, in verse 19, A feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. You know, Solomon was one of the wealthiest people that ever walked this planet. <laughs> He knew that money couldn't truly make us happy, but he was well aware that what could be achieved with money. I mean, wouldn't your life be a whole lot easier if you just had a little, more, little bit more money? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, college students, I mean, professionals, yeah. I mean, married. Yeah. Life would just be a little more easier, maybe a little more comfortable, yeah. and a little more bearable. But it's been said that money is not the root of all evil, but the Bible says that money is the root of all kinds of evil. You know, I sometimes think we can get kind of tripped up with that. But honestly, guys, I believe many Americans will not make it to heaven because they simply do not understand money. Mm -hmm. they, they don't understand God's hearts and don't give like he desires us to give. Money can be, de can be a deceitful thing, but we ought to go after understanding God's hearts. Yeah. In Matthew 9, verse 37, it says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are you. And the workers are you. Amen. Amen. They're few because there are so many people that are going after building up their own lives, their own careers, their own kingdoms, their own financial security. That's why they're few. Because people are focused on themselves and not focused on God's kingdom and God's heart. Amen. Come on, bro. I believe in this room there are people that want to build up God's family. You know, just hearing all the good news of people enjoying the, the Haymaker campaign this week. I'm excited for the Friend Maker and, the, and, the, and the, the Miracle Maker and the Disciple Maker. But I, I'm excited to see all the good news that, God, that God's doing. And all the hearts that, that are changing, even, these, next, even these, these short few days at the beginning of this year. Amen. You know, it's a privilege. Uh, Justin and I have been able to be in the full-time ministry since the, uh, about the beginning of uh, January 2016. So it's been about two years now. We've lived in, in uh, three different states, wow. oh, wow. uh, three different cities, and had three different apartments. Okay. Now, if you ever had to break a lease, mm. you, you, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know the issues you might run into. Mm. If you ever had to move somewhere, you know that it can be difficult to try and find people to come in and, and take sublet your place or to be able to break it or whatever. Mm. And I'll, I'll never forget, moving from Syracuse, New York, all the way down to Gainesville, Florida. Yeah. It wasn't until a day before we left wow. that we got our place sublet. Wow. Come on. Wow. I'll be honest with you guys, I was, I was struggling a little bit in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was wrestling, I mean, you can, you just can tell you, I, I was praying, I was hoping, but I was like, okay God, what are you gonna do? Wait for a miracle. And a miracle happened and it got taken, amen. 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 And I think what, what's the power of this book is that, that it helps us to focus on God's power. Amen. And we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit more, of that, more, more of that throughout the lesson. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. But I think about, even though I, I, I was struggling with, okay, God, what are you going to do with this, with this apartment? And, you know, honestly, guys, we, we, you know, you don't make a lot of money when you're in the ministry. But it was great how Jess's mom came back in November to visit us. And yeah. she visited the church, and she had a great time. But all the time she was asking, hey, what do you guys need? What do you guys need? What, what can I get for you? Wow. And we had, we had a hard time thinking, what do we actually need? Wow. Like, what is it that, that we actually really, truly need in our lives? And we're thinking through it, about everything. We're like, you know what? We're, we're pretty content. Amen. And it helped me see. It's like, wow, just with, with, with a lot of money or, or not a lot of money, that we can be content with God. Amen? Amen. Amen. We understand why it's important to give and how it's important to give. But my question for us tonight is, do you? 
When it comes to Jesus, what did he give to come to be with us on earth? Everything. Give up everything. You know, you think about the apostles. They, they died to preach the message. Jesus died to preach the message that eventually would be carried over all the way from, the, the, uh, the, the, to, from uh, Europe all the way to America so that one day that we could hear the truth. Amen. And that's the power of the message. That's, that's a power for people that live their lives in total sacrifice. Yeah. Willing to do anything, willing to go anywhere, and living to, uh, willing to give up anything to preach the gospel in this Amen. generation. Come on, bro. I would say Jesus understood giving. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, let's, let's turn to Matthew 22. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Peter. Matthew 22 in verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Come on. So when Jesus says, hey, love God with all your heart, how much is that? 100. 100%. 100% that is all your heart. Now, you're not going to be perfect, but that's why I appreciate we're not robots. Yeah. It's because we're not perfect and we have flaws. But we get to give God all our heart, all our passion, all our zeal, all our energy, all our mind, all our time, and all our dime. Amen. Come on. Come on. Is that your heart? Do you love God not with your words only and not with your emotions only? But where is your heart today? See, when you have a relationship with somebody, someone, you want to, you don't want to just kind of give partial, partial your heart. I mean, it wasn't incredible to see Marquez and Rachel get engaged. I mean, guys, there is a God. But, but imagine, imagine when they're at the altar and Marquez says, honey, Oh. Oh. I'm gonna give you part of my heart. Oh! oh. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you what. I, I bet you Rachel won't be too too fired up with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but you gotta consider how does God feel when we give part of our hearts? How much does it hurt when we give him part of our mind? Part of our soul, part of our strength. See, God wants everything. Come on, bro. You know, I want, you, I want you to consider tonight how many relationships or people have we hurt because of money? How many times have we lied even a little bit when it comes to money? You know, being asked to give money doesn't make us struggle. It just exposes what we, what we really are struggling with. Wow. That's right, bro. You know, I've been a disciple for, for only about uh, five and a half years. And, you know, twice a year we, we do special missions in, in May, November. And uh, I've seen people fall away, especially during these times, because they just lack the faith in God. And it's disheartening. But it reveals where they're really struggling at. It's not with money. It's with, that, does God truly love me? Is God going to supply for me when I'm in need? Wow. See, as a son and daughter of God, you get to be supplied by God because why? He loves you. Mm -hmm. He's going to take care of you. Why? Because you're important to him. Yeah. See, we've been asked, we've been commanded, we've been directed, and we've been commissioned by Jesus to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Come in on. this generation, guys. Yeah. He said to do it now, and we're going to do it by faith. Yeah. Now, that's a big endeavor, yeah. but with God, we can do it, can we not? Yeah. You see, Jesus died for the message, apostles died for the message, and guys, we're going to die for the message because we love God with everything we have, that's right, and we're willing to get the word out all over the world. Well, that's right. You know, some examples of, of giving of, of, uh, of giving people that you know, had, had a hard heart when it came to giving were the rich young ruler, Mark 10, mm -hmm. Judas Iscariot, Ananias and Sapphira. And with Ananias and Sapphira, they, uh, it, it wasn't about the amount they gave, it was that they, that they lied about what they did give. Yeah. And so... They held back and tried to make themselves look good by pretending that they gave a lot. Mm. And God didn't, didn't really look kind of in this. What did he do? He killed them. 
Evlat killed them because their hearts were greedy. How important is your relationship with money versus your relationship with God? You know, I want us to consider tonight, does God need our money? No. He does not need our money. But you know what God wants? Your hearts. Your hearts. Come on, bro. He wants all your hearts, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 8. The title of today's lesson is The Heart of the Matter. Come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. So what we're going to do, guys, these next uh, five Wednesdays, including today, is uh, we're going to kind of go section by section, and we're really going to breeze through three chapters tonight. So there's going to be a lot of different topics. Uh, again, I hope you're writing things down. And you have the books. So you can always go back to that and reference that as well. But in Genesis 8, um, in verse 20, you know, I think it's true that, that money does expose where we're at and it exposes our hearts. But the, the fact is God uses money to help us make sure we get to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because he wants to see if, if we understand the trust factor, the love factor. In Genesis 8, right here in verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all the living creatures as I have done. So I want you to imagine Noah. It took him about a hundred years to build this, this giant boat. And then it took him a little bit of time to get all these animals on the boat. And then it took some time for the earth to fill up with water. And then it took a little bit more time for that boat to float on the water for about 40 days. And you think about those 100 years and 40 days. And I mean, I don't know about, especially the college students, after you get done with the semester, all you want to do is celebrate and, and go, thank God, and go have some fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yet, the water goes down. The boat goes down, rests on a mountain, opens up, lets the animals out, and what's the very first thing Noah does? He builds an altar. For God. He builds an altar for God. See, point number one, it's all about the heart. Wow, come on, bro. Come on, Peter. He didn't throw a party. I'm sure he was excited, but I think he was excited because he saw God's word come true. He saw God's promises be fulfilled in his lifetime. You see, Noah simply just honored God. Is it your first thought to give back to God when he blesses you financially? See, God builds his dwelling place with willing people only. And God only wants willing people in his church. God only wants people in heaven that worship him willingly and that aren't half-hearted. Come on, bro. I mean, we talked about it a few months ago. That imagine if we're in heaven, and you see half-hearted people in heaven. That, that just really didn't want to be there. You see, when we're in heaven, guys, we're going to see people all around us that are just fired up, zealous, worshiping God. Like, like when Steve is singing up here, up here leading the song. Like when El Ensign's leading, leading, leading Let It Rise in front of choirs and choirs of angels. Oh, I mean, that, that boy's going to have some threads on. You guys are <laughs> You see, guys, when we're in heaven, there's going to be full-hearted people there. Yeah. And in God's church, there's going to be full-hearted people here. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Being willing, unwilling to give financially will eventually lead you to be unwilling to give in other areas of your life. But I want us to be honest with your heart and with yourself tonight. And then truly change and pray that, that, you know, that there aren't bitter feelings that are in your heart that you need to get out. See, God wants your hearts, not your money. Mm. I'm going to my wife share. Let's talk about this honestly because really thinking about money, I always just thought like, oh, you know, you just give when, when you can and stuff like that, you know. And then I was always very sketched out by churches that always preached about money a lot and stuff. But really seeing God's heart, especially as I was reading the scriptures that the book was referencing and even reading more scriptures, I was like, wow, God truly uses money to purify our hearts. 
We should be grateful that God asks us to give because he's, he's giving us opportunities to see what our heart really looks like before it's too late. Before we're, we're at the throne room and he's like, why was your heart so greedy? Or why was your heart so untrusting? And we'll be like, wait, what? And then, and then we're surprised. But money is something that kind of opens a portal for us to see our hearts how God sees us. So that we can we can do something about it, so that we can be uh, our hearts can be purified, you know. Because God always has purposes behind His commands. He doesn't just throw commands in there because he get, He's God and He can. I mean, He could, but He doesn't. He always has a reason. There's always a why behind what He does. You know, He wouldn't call us to give if there wasn't a why. Because God obviously doesn't need our money, you know. And so even for me, like I grew up. Um, kind of in a middle class family where we weren't rich, but we weren't poor. I always had everything I needed, but also my parents instilled in me, you know, you need to work for if you want anything extra. I'll give you the basics, and if you want those extra pair of shoes or whatever, you need to work for it. And so I kind of got this very independent spirit, and so, and I also, I have learned to value money which was really helpful, but I think I swung the pendulum too much because when I became a disciple, I mean, for a while when I was just religious, you know, if I had an extra couple dollars, I'd throw it in the plate, but I never was consistent. And so when I was challenged to give consistently, I was like, wait, why do you want my money? <laughs> because also I saw how churches had mishandled money and stuff, and people, you know, pastors driving BMWs and stuff like that. And so I was like, but why? You don't need my money. Wait. And then they, like, actually being challenged, or if I didn't give, somebody being like, hey, so I noticed you didn't give, you know, are you okay? Be like, why do you care? You know, why didn't you ask me about my quiet time? You know, and so then I started having trust issues, but it showed that I wasn't, because I wasn't trusting people, I wasn't trusting God. Because I'm giving to God, not people. And whatever people do with it, you know, that's between them and God. But for me, my heart lacked faith. And so I was really grateful that God exposed that in my heart so that, you know, I could be purified so then I could also have faith in other areas of my life as well. And so. Come on, you know, there are three reasons people, why people don't give. One, because of people. Or you have issues with somebody else, so because you have issues, I'm not going to give. You can write down Matthew 5, 21 through 25. The second reason is circumstances. No. I overspent this week. I don't have enough money for rent. You can write down Deuter Deuteronomy 23, 23. And then the third reason is doctrine. Right, well, I don't believe you need to give. We can write it down Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Here are the facts, guys. Did anyone tell Noah to build an altar? No. 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 Check out Genesis 14. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, and there's, there's a theme that you will see throughout the scriptures. See if you can just take time to really study them out. In Genesis 14, this is going to be in the time of Abraham. And it says over here in verse 18, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of the God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise to be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. <coughs> then Abram gave him a tenth, tenth of everything. Did anyone, give, did anyone tell Abram, Abram to give a tenth? No. 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 So... This, this, this myth of that we give 10%, guys, that's what it is. It is a myth. If, if we're going to be a church that holds, by, that, that holds by that, you need to go through every other thing and hold by everything, everything in the Old Testament. Wow. We are not a family that gives just 10%. We're a family that gives our hearts to each other. Amen? Yeah. That's right. Come on, Peter. It's oh, incredible. The amount was never command, but it was out of initiative. Wow. Giving to God is just a reminder that God is enough. Amen. Point number two. Did I say point number one? Yes. 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 Point number two. Why do you want to be rich? Mm. When I think of the problem, now I'm an engineer by trade. And when I think of a problem, I'm sure like Paul, I think of the easiest solution. I think, okay, what's going to cost me the less? What's going to be the less resources? What's going to be the, the least amount of time? And I'll never forget, I'm on a ship over in the middle of the Indian Ocean, 
And uh, you know, when you have these big ships, usually sometimes you have like, like a helipad. And when you have a helipad where some helicopters can land, you need some sort of fire extinguishing system. And so they had pipes and everything all, all around the, the helipad in case there was a fire. But it wasn't just like what, what's in the, that red bottle that we usually see around classrooms and buildings. They literally what they had was this, this, so, this really super dense, soapy solution that they just mixed with water. And it just foamed up and covered all the fire. Now, I never saw fire in the helipad. But this, this giant, this giant just, just huge metal drum, the bottom plug rusted out, and all that solution came right out. <laughs> wow. And we had to get all that solution out into, the, the, into these, these, uh, these 55 gallon drums. And the, the engineer comes up, and says, all right, here you go. He hands me this, this pump that you operate by hand. Oh. Hey, man. Come on, Daniel. And I'm like, I'm like there, there's over 200 gallons right here. Wow. And you want us to hand pump this thing? He's like, yeah, well, if you go too fast, it suds on up, and then you can't pump it. I was like, there's got, we're in the 21st century, there's got to be a way that you can get a pump and come in slow, and so I spent the next hour and a half searching the whole boat, looking for a pump that we could use. And that's, guess what, I didn't find a pump. I had to do it the hard way, man. But when I think of an issue, I think of the easiest way. You see, being rich, guys, is the easy way out. Being rich well, well, it makes it the hardest way to get to heaven. Wow. You think about all the times Jesus preached against, against rich people. Mm-hmm. Either rich in possessions, rich in doctrine, whatever it was. You put a name on it. Mm-hmm. You see, the problem that remained was the same, is that man had sin. And the only solution was Jesus. Wow. Having a desire for wealth and comfort wasn't part of Jesus' character. You can write down 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. But I want us to ask ourselves tonight, why do you envy people, uh, those who have an excess of possessions, or a satisfying bank account, or why do you want wealth? Right, these are questions that, that we got to ask ourselves. Why would you want some? Why would you want to do something that Jesus warns so many against? Mm. Because being rich is wanting the hardest way to heaven. It is literally the hardest way. I already told you, I like the easy way. And so I'd rather be a poor man just, just, just scraping by, but having a full heart and getting to heaven. Okay. Than having a hard time to try and make it home. Because that's where my home is. Wow. See, if you're rich, you have more to give up. And if you want to be known as someone who has great faith, you got to be known for someone that relies on God. Now, it doesn't mean to act unwisely with finances. We're going to talk about budgeting and stuff these next few weeks as well. But, but, it, but it's, it's understanding that the God is going to be the one that supplies you with everything that you need. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. If you want to be known as someone who has great faith, you've got to put, be put in a situation that, that uh, dictates that you need great faith in that situation. Yeah, come on, bro. You can write down James, uh, two, James 1, 2 through 10. Because when we have a lot of things, guys, then we have a lot of ability to rely on ourselves. Yeah. Right? If I had all the money I needed, and I got you know, a flat tire, two flat tires, oh, I can pay for that. It's fine. No big deal. Rather than finding if I need for God, praying to God, God, there's... Only you that's going to be able to help me get through this. Mm-hmm. Only you that's going to help me with my finances. And I'm trusting you. I'm going to be wise with, with, with what you give me. But you are everything that I need. Yeah. Come on, bro. You see, yeah. God wants to be a rescuer. Yeah. That's who God is, guys. Yep. You know, I don't know why we love all the Dis- Disney movies? <laughs> no. It's because you have people rescuing people all the time. Come on, we love heroes. Yep. We love superheroes, right, right, Frankie? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Frankie. <laughs> you guys are fired up for Avengers. I'm fired up to be an Avenger, amen? Yeah. Yeah. But you got to be put in a situation where you're needed. Yeah. You got to be put in a situation where you need God desperately. And a lot of times we don't like to do that because we don't want to be rescued. Yeah. Come on, Peter. Turn to Proverbs 23 real quick. 
Come on, bro. I want you all to learn from celebrities, people that have fame, fortune, and everything that they could ever have, yet they're killing themselves. There is so much drama, and they are so far from God. In Proverbs 23, in verse 4, the Bible reads, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. I mean, you guys ever got like, like, uh, like some money for Christmas? And then the next month, you're like, where'd that go? What did I spend that on? It's, but a glance, it's, just, it's here and gone. Yeah. But we have a hope that's in God that's eternal. Amen? Amen. You can write down Matthew 26, verse 15. We don't have time to, to go through everything. But money is what Judas betrayed Jesus for. Because Jesus wasn't enough for him. In the end, he wasn't happy. And in, in, in the end, he ended up committing suicide. There are two instances where Judas' heart was hard. One, where he stole money. And two, he felt that Jesus was wasting money. You guys remember when Mary Magdalene poured that whole jar of perfume? Yeah. Right, yeah. a year's wages? Yeah. Right? In American dollars, it keeps thinking about $60,000. $60,000, dollars just, just, just give it. And yet, Judas was like, hey, this could be given to the poor, but he was thinking about himself. Yeah. Yeah. Fact is, Judas never allowed, it, allowed his heart to get help, and so he fell away. See, when we neglect our convictions, eventually we turn, the, the, those convictions just turn into good ideas. And eventually our hearts just quickly wither away. I'm going to let Josh share real quick. Come on, Josh. Come on, Josh. Come on, Josh. Come on, Josh. And if you turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, um, it talks about, you know, Paul's hardships. And I won't go through all of them for time's sake, but one of my favorite parts is in verse 10, as he's listing off, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live, beaten and yet not killed. But then he goes on to say, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making others rich. Not having nothing, yet possessing everything. You know, and I think about, we just came from the Christmas season. You know, and as a kid, I remember having my long list that I would give to Santa Claus. And, you know, um, it was really awesome. Santa Claus was always very good to me. Um, and so, but the only thing is, like a couple months later, I would already be wanting to write my next year's list. I would already be comparing my stuff to what other people had or what other people got. I remember going to the playground and asking my best friend, so what did you get? You know, and they'd give me the whole list and I'd be like, I didn't get that. You know, because seeing that, that wealth is, it's an unreliable friend. These possessions really aren't the things that are going to give us everything like we think. When we have nothing, we possess everything. That's why I think about our brothers and sisters in India and in Manila. I don't know if any of you guys are who was able to go to Manila, but it's crazy to see that the, the poverty there, yet the extreme joy. When those disciples uh, greeted us at the airport, I was almost like, whoa, I need a minute here, because they were just so excited. But yet, the things that they had to do just to be there to greet us, and I've seen some disciples in America greet people at the airport, and they were not that fired up, and yet we have so much more. You know, and so I just think that they have a greater faith. Because they have to rely on God. You know, and uh, also over, uh, after reading this book, I was super convicted on how uh, much clothes I have. Mm -hmm. I have a lot. And I've talked to probably almost every sister about this. <laughs> yeah. But I started selling them. But at first, it was really hard. You guys don't know. It was really hard. I'd be like, but I wore that at my engagement picture. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I wore that. But I'll wear that again. Mm -hmm. And I just love having, because I love options. As girls, we love options. <laughs> but I just started seeing, like, I don't wear these things. And this is an excess. And so, and also I love to shop. I love to thrift. I think it's just fun. The hunt is awesome. But um, I just, I, I, when I started to sell, I started going thrifting to find things to sell for more money, to give permissions. And all of a sudden, thrifting became so much more fun. Because now I'm not buying for me. Now I'm buying with a purpose. Now I'm buying to sell, to be able to give back. And so now thrifting, I mean, was, you know, it's more fun for me because there's a purpose behind it. And so I see having nothing but yet possessing everything. I'm finding the true happiness in just what to do with wealth and worldly possessions. Mm -hmm. It just matters so much more to me now. And so, um, because when we think about it, the hunger for money 
can really lead us away from the kingdom and the mission by taking up our time. You think about it, having to work more than maybe you need to, or going out and spending extra money, going shopping for things that you don't need. Well, what could you be doing with that time? You know, and I think about what Peter shared, you know, deep convictions that are never practiced soon do become just great ideas. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in my own heart. You know, and so it's just amazing to see how God uses money to help keep us spiritual. Yes. Um, and so, yeah. Wow. Amen. 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 Guys, use these D groups that we're going to break up in as an opportunity to get open and to, and, and to, to not be like Jesus. I mean, don't, don't, be, don't betray Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Get open with the sin. Get open with where your greed is. And to and let the disciple come in, so your heart can be made pure, and so you can give God all your hearts. All right, point number three: Surrender. dealing with greed, need versus wants. Bring over Ephesians chapter five. Wow. Dealing with greed, need versus wants. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Ephesians chapter five. You guys are still with me? Yeah. yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. Just love I think there's some conviction settling in the hearts. Amen. Yeah. Come on, bro. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 3, it says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual morality. Alright, so let's stop right there. What's a hint? Well, if I was to give you a glass of water, I just put a little hint of cat urine. Oh! <laughs> of sexual morality. Not even a little bit. What else is there? It says, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral person, impure or greedy person, such a person is an idolater has any inheritance, any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Oh, baby. As I think oftentimes as Americans, we, we get extra money from this, a bonus check from here, and we think of, oh, great, I get an increase in wage, I get to increase my spending. We think of ourselves first rather than God first. Call it out, bro. We think that because we have a salary increase, so then can our spending increase. Mm -hmm. The biblical fact is we are given more from God to be able to give more to God. Amen. Yeah. Wow. None of that just wow. Yes. You know, and it was crazy. This was such a new teaching. Like, I was reading this part on the plane, and I was like, <laughs> because all my life I was always taught just you can be a prominent woman, get a great job, make a lot of money. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, make a lot of money. So I Google searched when I was like trying to figure out my career in high school, like what I wanted to go for. I Google searched the easiest jobs that make a lot of money. <laughs> you can see my heart there, you know, because what I really wanted. But, um, and so I, I clicked on it. Okay, so I, then I saw a surgeon. I was like, ooh, that makes a lot of money. But I was like, I don't really want to do that, but that makes a lot of money. Maybe I'll go for that. So for a while, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a surgeon. It's going to be awesome. Um, I'm going to hate my job, but the thing is, I'm going to make a lot of money, and so then I'll be able to enjoy my life outside of work and be able to buy all these things that will make me happy, and so it'll be awesome. And then I, that only lasted so long. But the thing is, essentially, though, I, see, I hear people complaining a lot of their, their jobs and their careers, but you ask them, why haven't you changed? Why don't, why don't you do something you love? And they're like, well, it doesn't make enough money. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, that, that I can't live off of that. And you know, Amen, you need to be smart, but the thing is you have to, you have to change your perspective about mm -hmm. what you do with your money. Yeah. Because money doesn't buy you happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, and seeing here that God hates greed. He hates it. There's only a few things that he that he hates, but this is one of them, a heart of greed. And seeing that greed equals sexual immorality, like, oh my goodness. And when I would think about it, I'd be like, you know, you always get open very, very quickly about any impure thoughts, any, you know, anything that, like that, that's serious, that's big stuff. 
but greed. I remember one time my sister, she had just moved to another city for a mission, um, as on a mission team. And she got open with me as I was calling her. She got up and she's like, yeah, I feel like I've been spending too much time unpacking and, you know, uh, spending too much time trying to build up my home and stuff. And I just needed to be open about it. And I was like, okay, Miss Mega Spiritual, like, that's not a big, why are you getting open? That's just, you know. But I had to see that because I didn't see greed the way that God sees wow. greed and the, the wow. intensity of it. Wow. And so I'm going to ask you, do you get open about greedy thoughts as you would any pure thoughts? Wow. You know, as you would any other sin? Um, and examples of these kind of thoughts are just desires for more clothes, bigger and better cars, shoes, overeating, wanting the latest possessions just because you can. And, and those are kind of some ideas because the world says greed is good and it actually preaches have more yeah. you deserve more you're entitled to an easier or a better life think about the slogans what's Burger King well Jesus is the way what Skittles what Skittles well Jesus made the rainbow oh. what's Disney a word Jade spoke about it. My dreams come true. But Jade even mentioned people get into a depression after they leave because it's almost not it's not real. Yeah. Temporary. You know, Red Bull, what's Red Bull? More like Red Bull gives you diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> It says, I was enraged by their sinful greed. I punished them and hid my face in anger, yet they kept on in their willful ways. What's the fact? God, uh, greed angers God. You can go to uh, Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. In verse 49, it says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. 
She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore I did away with them, as you have seen. Guys, God hates the imbalance of rich and the poor. Yeah. You know, I think one of the greatest lessons that, that we will ever learn, is, you know, if you have the privilege, privilege to be able to go on a, on a foreign mission team, one of the greatest lessons that you'll learn is that, that we are so entitled as Americans. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to uh, Richie and Elizabeth McDonald. Uh, they're, they're giving a contribution, me contribution message in, uh, in L.A. this past Sunday. And if you didn't know, they, they were leading the church in D.C. a year ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were called to take them, and I believe their three kids, all the way over to Manila, Philippines, mm -hmm. and lead a church of hundreds and for just, just about a year. Now, you, you can imagine being going from a first world to a third world, that's a culture shock. Yeah. And they get there, and they start unpacking everything in Manila, and you know, there's a sister that continues to help them, and you know, helps them with their family, helps them with the house, helps them with, uh, with unpacking and all that. And so they, they wanted to treat the sister and just say, hey, thank you so much for your, just serving your heart out. And they're like, you know, hey, we'd love to take you out uh, for dinner. What's your favorite restaurant? And the sister goes, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know, you, you know, what I'm you know, you know, English. Your English is pretty good. You know what I mean? What, what's your favorite restaurant? She's like, what do you mean? I, I, I don't go to restaurants. Wow. Wow. She works 12 hours a day, six days a week. And makes 250 American dollars a month. Wow. But she's grateful. Come on. Richie goes, like, like ever, you don't ever eat at restaurants? She goes, no, I don't eat at restaurants. Even a place that you go for, you know, celebrate your birthday or some, some exciting events? No. And he goes, well, what, what's your favorite type of food? She's like, well, I really love Indian. All right, guys, we're going to go to Indian restaurants tonight. <laughs> hey. They go out and celebrate. That was a good time. But we don't know how much we have until we understand how much we don't have. Yep. And I'm sure there's, there's at least a few of us that in the past seven days have eaten at a restaurant. But are there any possessions or lifestyle that you're, that you're unwilling to give up? You know, for, for some missionaries, they take the one suitcase challenge. Is they give up everything that's in their home and pack one suitcase and that's all they're going to live on and bring them to a new country, a new city. I appreciate Colton and Manny Rowan doing that as they moved from LA to, to, to um, Europe, to London, to be interns over there. And eventually they, they moved over to Boston to be able to plant the Boston church. You see, sacrifice goes a lot, way, a lot longer way than you think. It's going to affect a lot more people. You know, and even thinking about the one suitcase challenge, I think about when I was single, I was able to fit all my possessions in my little two-door Honda um, very easily, and that's how I moved from uh, Michigan to Syracuse and Syracuse to Boston. But it was really interesting because, and I was always fired up, yeah, let me do the suitcase challenge, that'd be fun, and stuff like that, but then I got married. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we got all these nice furniture as wedding gifts, and so many gifts, and, and you just start collecting things. You know, things have, you know, um, they're like memorabilia of things from your wedding. And all of a sudden, my love for possessions started to get exposed, especially when we started moving. Because when we started moving, things that uh, I really liked that were new, they started getting scratched. Mm -hmm. They started getting broken. Uh, we had this big box of my favorite mugs, my coffee mugs. Mm -hmm. The whole box pretty much got broken. And I struggled in my heart. They're just coffee. But I still struggled with my heart, and I got upset, and I started being like, well, if we didn't have to move so much, those were starting to be thoughts, and I had to catch myself, because wow. the love for possessions just slowly started to creep in, you know, and God started to use, use me moving to start exposing my heart, wow. you know, um, and just thinking about, too, like, all my friends that just got married, especially from my high school and stuff like that, I look on Facebook, Facebook, it's always a battlefield mm -hmm. of the mind. Um, and they post all these pictures, they just got dogs. And it's really cute, they have their little puppies and them running with their puppies, and I'm like, oh, I want that so bad. Um, but the thing is, when I talked to Peter, we just can't afford it right now. And at first I was like, oh, 
come on, really? But then I had to think about it. Okay, I have to live within my means, but can I be content? Like, God has given me so much. Why am I focusing on the few things that I don't have? Um, and it just is, again, God exposing my greed, yeah. my want for possessions, these things that keep me enslaved to friendship with the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can't grow in my friendship with God. Mm -hmm. You know, and even thinking that for a second, my heart got a little bitter with Peter when he's like, no, no dog. Like, oh, you're controlling me. Uh, <laughs> to uh, Mark 4. Come on. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Mark chapter 4. Now, now a lot of us, we, we all know that the parable of the sower uh, talks about the, the four different seeds that, that fell on, on four different soils. You have the, the path, the rocky, the thorny, and then the good soil. Mm -hmm. but, but let's read this real quick in verse 18. It still says in Mark 4, 18, Still others like seeds are among thorns who hear the word, but the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. You know, the desire for wealth makes us unfruitful, guys. Yeah. Being overweight is often a sign of an unchecked greed. Mm -hmm. Greed is the excessive desire to have, to acquire, to possess, or consume more than one needs or deserves. <coughs> greed is deceitful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come on, bro. You can write down Ecclesiastes for, uh, chapter 3, verse 11 through 14. Basically, guys, most debauchery or greed is rooted in the what do I want now? Yeah. When you get bored or upset and turn to things not God, that's where greed sets in. Mm. It leads to being an inactive in, in terms of preaching the word of God and helping people become disciples. Greed comes when we make decisions based off desires, but not off spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. You know, how much do you work? How much do you do homework? How much do you study? Do you work more than you need? And that's compromising time that you could spend with disciples. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason why holidays can be so hard is because we're not actively, actively, actively involved in the mission. God is enough for us at some times, and so we crave people's approval. Always wanting more than we actually already have. But what's the greatest gift we have, guys, is God. Yeah. What's our reward in heaven? That's God. Yeah. It's not on earth. Our greatest reward is not of this world. Amen. We can take our final, chapter, our final uh, scripture over here in Luke chapter 10. So like I said, there's a lot of scriptures, a lot of teaching. We just covered about... Uh, three chapters in the book, and so I hope you really have to take time to read it last, last month if you haven't, read through it this month. But in verse 17, it says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons believe, sorry, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At the time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, 
Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and revealed them to little children. Mm. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. Mm. You know, please God to give us the kingdom, because we came in as a child. Yeah. Came in humble to learn, humble to grow, humble to be taught everything even from scratch. I hope tonight, guys, you learned the, the heart of giving. Wow. Yeah. See, our reward is in heaven, where it can never be taken away. The heart of the matter begins where? In the hearts. Mm. Search for yourself why you want to get rich, and examine your needs versus your wants. Guys, as we break into D groups, let's examine four basic questions. Do you think God would say that you've been giving to him generously? What areas have you been greedy in? And what's one change you're going to make tonight? We're going to break into D groups. Actually, I have the, the list. Uh, David, you have a black folder. Thank you. Uh, we we, we have, a, have a whole list of different groups we're going to spread it, uh, break into. Did now, you it's, repeat the three questions? Yep. Three questions are Do you think God would say you've been giving to Him generously? What areas have you been greedy in? And what's one change that you're going to make tonight? I can say this again if anyone needs it. Yes, please. All right. Do you think God would say you've been giving to him generously? What areas have you been greedy in? And what's one change you're going to make tonight? Amen, guys? So I'm going to list off the, the groups now. We have, we have uh, group leaders for each group. Uh, myself, Brandon, and Steve will be.